Good morning. All right, glad to have all of you with us this day. All the families together. Okay, so let me just say, we wanted to try something different. Uh, and so it's different. We got everybody in here together. And uh, I just want you to know it's beautiful. As Gunnar said, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, we wanted your children to see you worship as we come to worship together. We're going to do this about four more times this year, the fifth Sunday of the year. So some of you I know came for the first time and you're like, oh, yeah, it got a children's church and it's awesome and all that. It is, but it's not today. So, uh, I mean, not, we're not doing that today. So uh, we're, we're going to uh, speak last week. If you are here last week, I'm pretty sure I preached the longest sermon I ever preached last week. And this week it may be the shortest, but don't get your hopes up. <laughs> Because last week, I thought, man, this is going to be quick. And I thought I had extra five minutes, and I took ten more extra. So uh, anyway, we're glad to have you with us as we worship together. I know they got things for the kids to do or participate in this morning. Uh, something I want to share, because you're going to see a video at the end, because we're talking about families. One of our own, one of our uh, college students, uh, Hannah Morris, is going to be going on a mission trip uh, over the summer for three months uh, an undisclosed place in Asia, we're reaching an unengaged, unreached people group, uh, one of them places you can't tell where she's going to. Uh, and so we wanted, as our church family, to help support her on that. So today is the day, we told you about a month ago, start praying to what God would have you put in. So I put mine in, in an envelope. I got an envelope from the back, wrote down the amount, and Anna, Hannah, it's named around. I just want to tell you, as I wrote mine out this week, I had prayed for it about this, and uh, God said, you need to feel it. So I, I, the check was big enough that I felt it, all right? So, you know, if you're saying, ah, 10, we'll help, mission, you know, if you can't feel 10 or 20 bucks, come on, pray, ask God, and let's bless her. I, I, I'm hoping that she goes, and she's like, wow, look at God go, you know, and, and we take care of that for her, because she's given time and all that uh, on this trip. So pray about that. You should have already prayed. You should have already gave, but you can do that at the end as well. Um, also, as a church, uh, some of you have gone on our Dominican uh, public, Dominican Republic trip, uh, mission trip. It's going to be July 15th through 21st. Some of you have gone and taken family with you on that. It's a trip that you can do that, uh, where we build a house for some people in a place called Mocha, uh, which is kind of a village that we've kind of adopted. Uh, but if you want to go on that trip, we need to know now. So fill out a Connect card. I have some people after this last service that said they, they want to go uh, see me. If you don't know anybody else, how I want to go uh, on that trip or I got interest in it. Because if you're going to go, we need to know now because we got to start getting um, plane tickets and all that. So if you understood that, all that, say right, right. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time together, Lord. I pray that you would... Uh, this is a beautiful day, beautiful time together, Lord. I pray that you would speak to us through your word. If there's anybody that's hurting, needs something, Lord, I just pray that you touch their hearts. If there's anybody that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray for their salvation, God. I just pray that you would meet with us right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wow, so uh, last week we talked about the church. Okay, so those that don't know, we're doing this series called As You Go. As You Go, as a, as a follower of Jesus, the disciple of Jesus, you, if you are a Christian, you are on mandate. Jesus said, go and make disciples. So we are going. So we thought about what, where is it you go? We, the gospel goes with me wherever I go. Where do I go? And, and we talked uh, the first week, or well, first place it needs to be is at your house. So we talked about families, which have been great. We'd have done that today, but it's, it, this is the order. So the family, and then last week we talked about the church because we got to be together as a church if we're going to go, if this thing's going to last, right? And we know, we've all seen churches bicker and all that and churches split and die and all that. I mean, it's just, it just, it happens. But, and, but we talked about how the church can be awesome when it's together. And so we talked about that last week. So we know this, that together we can get a lot done for the kingdom of God. But the thing about the church is sometimes what happens is, is we get all comfortable because we all know Jesus, love Jesus. We're nice to each other. We're, we get up in here and we huddle up and, and that's as far as you go. We get so comfortable we don't do anything. It, it, it's like this. It's us four and no more can be really comfortable. But once we die off, the church is gone. So if we get a church, we start, and it's just all us, and it's all people just like us, 
then it will die off. That's why we follow the mandate to go, to go out there and, and reach people for the name of Jesus. And so the week before we talked about the house and then the church, today we're going to talk about the neighborhood, your neighborhood. So I'm not going to point them out, but somebody introduced somebody this morning and said they came with them, said this is my neighbor. So this, this is for you, okay? Um, but that is the first mission field outside the door, outside my door. I'm finally, I'm getting out and uh, meet my neighbor. So you're, so you're going to work, you're going to school, you're going to home, uh, you're, you know, home every day, but church maybe a couple times a week or small groups mixed in there, but you're in your neighborhood, even though there's a lot of coming and going and happening, we're, we're, we're passing by a lot of houses, people, as we come and go. And by the way, you know there's people in those houses, right? Here in Florida, we only know people are in those houses after a hurricane has knocked the power out and we're all outside. Well, y'all, y'all got power? Y'all got power? Yeah, I mean, we're, everybody, you know, that, that's, that's just, anybody, y'all know how that is? Is your neighborhood like that? Mine like that. I mean, I, you get to know them after a hurricane. So I look forward to her. No, I don't. No, I don't. So, so as you go, let's talk neighborhood. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind you, start with prayer. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your neighbors even before you know the names. Start there. So who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus covered that in the parable, the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. So we're not going to cover that this morning in the message. It would be a great lesson for you to study at home with your family, uh, with your own children. And by the way, let me go ahead and say this, with friends, if you're single. By the way, I know we talk about the house and the family. I know there are people single in here. I know the people are, that are single in here because you want to be single, and there's people in here that are single because you didn't want to be single. But I, 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 I know, just, just take just go with me, okay? Just go with me. I understand everybody. And we try to, as a church, to be understanding of all that. We know everything. We know that one size doesn't fit all, right? You know that. You know that saying, one size fits all. You know, you know what that means. It, it, one size, it fits. It means it fits nobody. So, there's that. So, so your neighbors. Um, The Ten Commandments, you got the Ten Commandments. Well, I love, I love what Jesus does with the Ten Commandments when he's pressed on what's the greatest of these commandments. I love that Jesus, Jesus is for me, he's for us. He breaks it down to two. He says, just love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He said, and love your neighbors yourself. Got it, got it. I mean, everybody can remember that, right? I love it. Can you quote, I'm telling you, I probably cannot quote the Ten Commandments right now, all right? Uh, but I can, ha- I love that Jesus gives the the just breaks it down to what it is exactly, right? But who's my neighbor? Well, there's some neighbors that you know. There's some you don't know. Sometimes it's the people on your street. Sometimes just nearby. Sometimes you might have something in common. Sometimes nothing in common. Sometimes they're family. I know some of y'all, you got like house, house, house and it's family. I know one, I know a lot, you know, a lot of folks, I'm staying as family, I know that, that kind of right there together. If, if it's our own neighborhood, I mean, it's, it's often our own neighborhood that we don't know that well in our transit society because we're always going. We, we know people across town at work, at the ball field better a lot of times. So what's the difference between a neighbor you have met and a neighbor you don't want to or care to meet? Well, if you haven't met them, then you don't really know. It doesn't make a difference. You have no idea until you say, hi, my name is... In John chapter 4, Jesus takes the disciples to Samaria. Now they, they were the neighbors that they never talked to. Uh, we had a guy in church, I can do this now, see, the guy in church that was here earlier, uh, 
and him and his neighbor because they used to talk over the fence and he invited them to church over the fence, you know. Uh, but we're talking about people that you wouldn't talk to over the fence, <laughs> those neighbors, all right? Uh, how many of you have neighbors that you have never met or never talked to? Don't raise your hand. Um, just think about that. To be clear, by neighborhood, we mean where you live, where you reside, your address, where you stay, all right? And I know that some of you, like, live, especially out here, some of you live like Fort Knox. Man, ain't nobody getting in that place, all right? I mean, if they drive down that road, uh, yeah, I hear you. You drive down that road, they know you, or it's, you know, I mean, right. So, but, but even you got neighbors, maybe, just work with me. The, 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 who you would call your neighborhood, all right? Why y'all will give me such a hard time out there? Tough crowd. Again, it's often our neighborhood we don't know well in our transit society because we go across town for work and play, etc. Now, the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman was the neighbor that Jesus first told he was Messiah. I love this, that we are all, you know, who, you know who our neighbor is? Jesus is our neighbor. In John 1, 14, it tells us that he, that he came and he dwelt among us. He pitched his tent among us. So whether you're in Africa, India, right here in Schmuckla, Florida, Jesus is your neighbor. Not Mr. Rogers, Jesus. Yes, I mean, so anyway, the Samaritan woman, she was the neighbor that Jesus first told her he was the Messiah, and she went and she told her neighbors. Now, this dear lady may have lived a sordid life up until she met Jesus, but she did know her neighbors, and many got saved as a result of her witness. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus teaches a lesson about who your neighbor is, and that parable contains great truth. But our focus this morning is on Jesus' encounter with a neighbor on the other side of the tracks. Now, you may know the story as the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, and verse 1, we read, Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, for homework, I really, kids, homework. For homework, I really want all of you to download the chosen app and watch season one, episode eight, if you have not. If you haven't watched the chosen yet, what is wrong with you? I was in the parking lot after church talking to people. They go, that's the one we're watching tonight. And man, hair was rising up. We were getting teary eyed. I ain't lie, I was. Every episode, man. The first episode is tough, but after that, man, it just, anyway, just trust me. Chosen app, get it on your phone, show it up on your screen, and watch see episode 1.8. 1, 1, all right? Because it does such a great job with the whole story that we're talking about today, but watching the, watching the disciples squirm uh, when Jesus told them that they were going to cut through Samaria on their trip was priceless. The disciples had their maps out where they were going to go, you know, and Jesus telling them this way, and they're like, oh, we don't go that way. And, they're, you know, there's... I love how verse 4 is worded in the King James. It says, it says about Jesus, he must needs go through Samaria. Or in New King James, it says, he needed to go through Samaria. And in every other English translation, basically says that Jesus had to go through or pass through Samaria, and I had to listen to that story on the Bible app on the way to church this morning. So I'm listening to John 4 on the ESV, and, and the way the guy was reading it, it just says well, he had to go through, 
Just the way, nonchalant like Jesus had to go through Samaria. Let me tell you, I'm like, no, he didn't have to go through Samaria, except he had to because the Holy Spirit was telling him, go this way. You see, the Jews would have absolutely not gone the way Jesus went from Judea up to Galilee. They always went, there was a road called the King's Highway. They would go up near the Mediterranean Sea and go around, or they would go over the Jordan River and go around. You know why they would go around? They were going around Samaria. So there's this big, I don't know how many of you like to take the long route. I guess they both were scenic routes, but they went the long route because they would not go through Samaria. Both routes allow the traveler to avoid Samaria. We're like, we got our suburban. We're going through there. We we'll, we'll, windows up. We're, yeah, it couldn't do that then. You were going to interact, rub elbows with people you didn't want to rub elbows with. You see, Samaritans and Jews did not get along. They despised one another. They would not even talk to one another. Now, that's a story for another day, but let me tell you, just tell you, any amount of racism that we say, see today, it paled in comparison to the Jew and the Samaritan. They would just laugh at what we call it. I mean, it was horrible, extra. Well, we'll lighten this up for our purposes. These were the neighbors they didn't talk to. So let's just say whatever we should do for neighbors that we wouldn't normally talk to, we ought at least to do for ones that we would talk to. Does that make sense? I'm just trying to get you to take baby steps. Crawl, walk, run, all right? Let's, 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 take, let's try not the hard neighbor to talk to first. Let's start with the easy ones. Y'all got me? Y'all with me? Just say yeah, if, even if you're not, all right? We'll, or we'll be stuck here, all right? Uh, one, uh, I got a friend who's uh, got uh, a neighbor that goes around with a, a, a wheelbarrow in the neighborhood. And he's found out that he can't put anything that he wants to keep at the edge of his carport because this particular person thinks it's his. He says, I'm putting stuff out there. He said, I, he said, I went fishing the other day and I had my kayak. I hadn't put it up yet and it's laying in the carport. And he says, I saw him on it going by. I'm like, what? So he drove around with it on his truck for a few days, you know, you know anyway. Now you may know who it is, but. Look, we must slow down and look around if we're to meet our neighbors. We gotta slow down. And I can honestly say that I am, this is the case where I am the best person to talk about this because I am an introvert. Now, some of y'all, some of y'all in here, y'all could have an entertaining conversation with a fire hydrant. I mean, y'all just, y'all make friends, y'all talk to anybody, hey, you know, everybody knows your name and all that, but, but I'm speaking, I'm speaking for the IVs, the introverts this morning, all right? You see, for the introverts like me, it, it's, you, you do not, I do not have the right to remain silent about Jesus and what he has done in my life. So I have to meet my neighbors, no excuses. Now, Jesus, Jesus took time to talk to this woman. He asked, her, he asked her for water. And by the way, two times in the Bible, Jesus asked for water. Neither time did he get water, just so you know. And the conversation, it's just great. In John chapter 4, and I don't have time, I'm not going to read all of that, even though it's almost blasphemous that I'm not reading all that because I love this story. But the conversation went back and forth about the Jews versus the Samaritans, and eventually it got to religion because she brought it up, not him. But Jesus brought it back to relationship, not religion. You see, Jesus didn't show up to uphold religious traditions. The Jews could testify to that. He was ticking them off at every corner. No, Jesus came to save us, to save us from our sins. He ain't got no time for that other. So, we can do small talk if that's the burden that I bear. We can simply ask someone how we can pray for them. 
it did eventually, this conversation did eventually lead into spiritual conversation. And Jesus was respectful to the woman. You know, sometimes we have more time than other times to get to know people. The bottom line, it takes time to get to know people. And that time may vary, but we should take the time. And like Jesus did, take the time to ask questions and listen. Don't be like thinking what you're going to say next, right? Listen. Trust the process. If you're having a Jesus conversation, listen to where somebody's at, right? You don't know where they're at. Uh, you may be talking to them about God as a father, and their father beat them, right? There's other ways. God is father, but there's other ways that you can talk to somebody. You need to listen to the person that you're talking to. If God is wanting you, if he's wanting you to say, he will tell you spirit to spirit what he wants to have you to say. And it just shows you care. And listen, everyone we meet is someone for whom Christ died. Everybody you meet. Everyone you meet is one for whom Christ died. And we know that everyone is going through something, right? How many of you right now are going through something? Go ahead, don't be shy, raise your hand. All right, I, earlier I had somebody raise both hands, you know, which made me go, you know, you're right, you know? I mean, folks are going through stuff. And we care about what, God cares about as his followers. Amen? Amen? So after some banner back and forth, Jesus and the woman talking, Jesus, look, Jesus understood that she had been through a lot in this life. He knew what she'd been through. And she was hardened. She, we, listen, we will meet people that have been through it. So after some banner back and forth, Jesus, he, you know what he does? He puts himself out there. He tells her that he's the Messiah. You know, he's not really told anybody that yet. This woman out here, woman he shouldn't even be talking to for multiple reasons, he tells her he's the Messiah. Listen, it takes time to build a relationship of trust. And in this case, we see that Jesus added to that vulnerability vulnerability. He told the Samaritan something that would have likely gotten him killed. By the way, it is what got him killed once he got Jerusalem. But none of this happens if he didn't go through Samaria and have this encounter with this woman at Jacob's will. Had Jesus kept with the Jewish tradition as a Jewish man, he would have not even talked to this woman. He would have made, it, it would have made him ritualistically clean, unclean. But that is not the end of the story, and it's not even why we're talking about this. You see, Jesus is Jesus. Jesus is God. He's Messiah. He knows every heart. He can perform miracles. No, we're talking about this story because we learn from the woman. Not the disciples. Lord knows where they were. Jesus, Jesus drops the bomb on her. He says, I'm the Messiah. And then the disciples show up. So we fast forwarded through the really best part of the story. But to get to this, she, we read in uh, verse 28 and 29. So the woman left her water jar and, and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So she dropped her water jar, which is the whole reason she walked there in the scorching heat anyway. She dropped her water jar at the scene of the encounter. She couldn't get to town fast enough to her neighbor's. So the woman, she went to her neighborhood. They weren't Jesus' neighbors or the disciples' neighbors. They were her neighbors. She went to her neighbors with the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. You see, the Jews and Samaritans were looking for the Christ. They were looking for the Messiah, both of them. These two groups that hated each other were both looking for the Messiah. She ran and she told them, her neighbors, come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. Is this not the Christ or can this be the Christ? Now, this woman, as you could figure, 
you got to know she had the street smarts, right? She, she had seen enough fakes to recognize the truth. I mean, you, you ever had, met somebody that's naive and they would believe anything? Huh? This was not that person, right? She'd been lied to and been through so much. You ain't faking her out. And we see that real truth turns doubters into believers. Real truth turns doubters into believers. We had some men give testimonies of what Jesus Christ had done in their life here Thursday night. They've only been saved like three or four years. I think I got the numbers close. And yet there's some guys in here that knew their, te- they knew them way back when. And they heard how these guys are teaching God's word. That's a long way from where they were. That's what Jesus does. That's a testimony. And this lady comes up, she's giving testimony. So she, she, she knew, she knew that Jesus had said enough truth that she believed enough to go tell the neighborhood this truth. I'm betting with a crowd like this this morning, there's someone that's heard enough truth but you still haven't believed. You, you still haven't taken it in. My dad came by this week and we we're talking about, I was, we we're talking about relatives and I was asking about relatives who me and him and, and family we've shared Jesus with through the years and who's saved, who's not and stuff, trying to figure that out. And he brought up somebody that, that we both witnessed to multiple times. He said, you know, he was telling me about it. He said, you know, I was talking to him when he knew he was dying. I mean, he knew he had days left. And he knew about Jesus. He knew up here. See, there's a lot of people that know that Jesus is God's son, that he came, he died on the cross, was resurrected on the third day, he's coming back for it. know all that stuff up here, but they've not received him, made him king in their life. On his deathbed, he was still saying, I mean, there was not a chance for him to do any stupid sinning that he probably wanted to do and and cling on to, but he wouldn't even surrender. This woman, she heard the truth, and she went and told some people about it. She brought her neighbors. She brought her neighborhood to Jesus. She didn't just go get one person. She brought her stinking whole neighborhood to Jesus. Listen, you don't sit on that kind of news. Some fella comes up, he tells you these things, he's a Messiah, tells you stuff nobody else knew about you, and, and he says he's a Messiah. You, t- you, you believe and you start telling people about that. She had an impact on her neighbors because she knew them. And they knew her. Listen, it's hard to properly influence or actively influence or effectively influence people when you don't have a relationship with them. She had been married five times. She told Jesus that, and Jesus said, yeah, you ain't talking about that one you live with now. That's when she said, oh, you're a prophet. But she had been married five times, so that tells me something. She knew some people, right? Herb's family, Frank's family, Claude's family, all these families. I'm sorry if your name is any of those names, but I mean, that's a lot of broken relationships, isn't it? But they're relationships and people that knew her and they saw a difference when she come talking to them. Verses 39 and 42. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. They came to Jesus because they knew her. You know, I can't just go up to my neighbor and and say, hey, you know, let me share this with you without getting to know him a little bit, right? 
Maybe you have to do that on an airplane, gospel sharing time, but not your neighbors. Many believe because of her testimony. When they see a difference in your life, the life transformation was obvious right away for her. Listen, many will believe because of your testimony. Not all, but many. But this, for sure, none that you don't tell will believe. Some that you do tell will believe. And by the way, I know some of y'all worried about Jesus getting that drink of water. He finally got a drink of water, I'm sure, as the town pleaded with him to come and stay with them for a couple of days. I'm sure they showed, rolled out the red carpet and were very hospitable to him. They welcomed him into their homes for a couple of days, and it says that many more believed because of his word. They heard from Jesus themselves. But get this. Jesus doesn't get in the door with their neighbor without their neighbor speaking up. Let me ask you this morning. Which of your neighbors will not hear about Christ until you go? Who in your neighborhood has claimed Jesus as their personal Savior since you moved in or if you were first since they moved in? I told you I'm the right one to talk about this because I'm an introvert. You got to understand this. When I moved into my neighborhood, somehow, I don't know how do people know this. Somehow people knew that I was a preacher already. You know how I know? You know how I know people know I'm a preacher? It's like, because, well, y'all will do it. If I'm standing in the back, when you walk out, you're not going to look at me. <laughs> I come to the men's bar meeting. I come to the men's bar meeting. I wear my hat and everything. And nobody, knows. I get in line, lines long out the door. I don't, I don't sneak in the back door. I get in line with whoever's there. And I was with, <laughs> he's not in here. He was at first service. There was a man, that's been, he's been coming lately. Uh, and I couldn't think of his name, so I didn't I really know him, but I, I, I knew I'd seen him. And uh, we're standing in line, and he says, so how long you been coming here? <laughs> I said, uh, 22 years. And uh, he's kind of, oh, wow, that's long. You know, and he still didn't, I knew he still didn't know. <laughs> but uh, later, everybody kept coming by, hey, and shaking my hand. And finally, by the time we got our food, he was like, uh-huh, you know, <laughs> so... I say that, I say that, but, but meeting my, I'm just saying that meeting my neighbors, you know, first I know they knew I was a preacher and then reaching out to them was different. So I, I just got to tell you, I, I'm told you I'm an introvert. So it was a couple of years, a couple of years before I went to certain neighbors and I, you know what I had to do? I had to apologize. I said, hey, I'm, Norman, da, da, I know, you know, you know, you, you, probably you and my wife, maybe Facebook friends or something, I don't know, whatever. But I have not come over here to, to check on you and share the most important thing that ever happened to me in my life and share Jesus with them. Now, I'll say this, I have since everybody, I got, you know, and I've led one of my neighbors in their driveway to the Lord. I've got some that, that were real close and gave me one of these, you know. I'm still, you know what I'm doing? I'm praying for them. Some other ones told me they are. I'm just not so sure about, yeah, you know, just because I don't see any fruit. You know, there should be some fruit in your life. People should know. This woman obviously had some fruit after just meeting Jesus. Here's the win for today. If all that happens from this sermon is that people learn the names of their neighbors and start praying for their salvation. If you just start doing that, I trust this God. I trust the process. God will move you to go. Now, I have since learned that some of these neighbors that I've shared with, they know some of y'all. It may be you that leads my neighbor to Christ because, you know, I get the... <laughs> so. But you get in the back door, front door, whatever, side door. You, you're allowed in. And here's a bonus. Here's a bonus. I'm, this, is, this is way out there, so I don't expect a lot of you to take me up on this, but 
You could start a CPR group, care, prayer, relationship, small group in your neighborhood. Invite your neighbors to come. Last week was, I think, my longest sermon. I had like, I looked at my clock and I had like five early extra minutes, so I took 15 extra. This week is the shortest. So what is God saying to you? Now is your time to respond in whatever God is saying to you. Maybe, uh, maybe it's to go on the mission trip. You heard that early on. Maybe it's to give for Hannah's help her on her mission trip. Maybe it's to accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've been holding out for so long, and today would be the day of salvation. Maybe you fill out on your card, I'd like to get baptized. You saw the baptism video. We're going to do it. We're warming that water in the creek right now. It's warming. We're getting it ready. We got a list of names going. We're going to contact you and let you know when we're doing that. Maybe it's to get in a small group. I got somebody else that wanted to get in a small group this morning. You know, just whatever God is leading you. Or maybe it's to come up here and kneel and pray. Look, kids have done great today, haven't they? Hey, yeah. okay, they've done great. And we're glad to have them in here. You know, a, a church that doesn't have children ain't making it. So we're thankful for that. Thankful for those, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm thankful for those that serve and work with the children each week. I didn't do that in earlier service, so they don't know that. But we are thankful for that. I bet you are thankful for that, aren't you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and respond however God is speaking to you. You know, it, 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 God, can, God can get onto our hearts all he wants, but if we don't respond, then nothing just happens.